Good morning, guys. Good morning. I, uh, thank you. I'm speaking this morning in the second part of a message series we've called a Maranatha Christmas. And it's not meant to be taken by itself. It's meant to be fit into a four-part series where we're looking each week at how one of the Gospels handles the telling of the story of Jesus coming, right? Last week, Pastor Jeff talked about the Gospel of John and how Jesus was ever-existent. In the beginning was the Word. And you should go back and listen to that. Then you should listen to what I'm saying today. And then Kevin speaking next week on the book of Luke. And then Pastor Jeff will be speaking the next week again on the book of Mark. And you should listen to all of them. So they're not meant to be understood totally by themselves. But hopefully there's enough in here that if you should just listen to them all. I'm not going to give you whatever. I'm not letting you off the hook. Um, so I want to get into this. Our church name this year, January, uh, officially is the time where we mark a year after we changed our name to Maranatha. But this time last year, we, um, the, God had delivered it to us and we were contemplating it as a leadership team. So it's interesting to me, this time last year, it reminds me as we're entering December again, this was the time we were kind of first talking a whole lot about that and all these kinds of things. So it's, I feel like it's kind of a perfect annual celebration now, <laughs> you know, and, uh, we wanted to, since we have changed our name, focus on the name we carry every, every day of the year is an announcement that both Jesus has come and that Jesus is coming. And it states about a kind of a condition that we exist in as followers of Jesus, part of his kingdom that isn't fully realized but has been begun amongst us, and we are part of it now. You kind of, in a way, can't be more part of it. You follow what I mean? It's, if, if eternity is now or it's never, you see? And we're a part of God's kingdom now, and his kingdom is just increasing. Like the sun rising in the morning, like this image we have here of light breaking into darkness like a traditional church would celebrate in this season, Advent, and we have done before, is each week you light a new candle to represent the coming of the light. And we are light bearers and all this sort of thing. So we're going to look today at how the book of Matthew in the Gospels, the first book of the New Testament, handles the telling of this story of Jesus coming and what it says to us as his followers in the in-between he has come, yet he is coming, and what that feels like. And we're going to talk about, have you ever, has God ever promised you something? And it's like in the scriptures, God makes lots of promises to his followers. So he's promised you those things, whether you realize it or not. But sometimes you see one and you're like, I need that. And if that's in fact a promise, then that song he was just singing right before this, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. These kinds of things. But then also God sometimes puts into our hearts promises that are specifically to us. Unique promises. He'll put it in. God speaks to us as individuals. And we need to be open to hearing that. Um, you can get weird with that. <laughs> and think God's promising you things that he hasn't. But more often than the fact, I think that God does promise us things pretty clearly. He speaks to us in ways we understand. But... Have you ever been frustrated by a promise that God's given you and you're like, it's not working out like I thought or how I thought or when I thought? Okay? Because sometimes God's put something in my heart and then when it finally materializes, I go, I'm not, and I'm like excited about it. And I'm like, I'm not even sure I like this. Usually I come around, you know, <laughs> more often than not. Well, so I probably wouldn't work here. But the point being, God's promises and God's ways of answering those promises are beyond usually our understandings. And our faith must be in Him. 
and including how he chooses to work out his purposes. So we're going to talk about the book of Matthew, as I've said like four times. Matthew, you, you, each one of these gospels um, were laid down, they were written out by people, actual people. We can't over-spiritualize or over-romanticize everything in our faith. This is real. We don't get to make it up. Like, God doesn't just have to do something because I decided he should, or you decided he should, or you feel like it. It's a faith that's been handed down to us by faithful believers for thousands of years. And one of the ways they did that was they wrote things down. They were written on paper by people for a purpose and then carried on, okay? So they had to be translated. We don't speak these languages as well anymore, or most of us don't, you know? And the cool thing about it is the, in the last century, there's been lots of work and research done by scholars, and we're finding out our biblical translations are quite good, you know? They're not finding a lot of stuff where we're like, hey, we finally dug up another old copy, of which they do from time to time. You've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls and things like this. And they compare, like, hey, guys, how are we doing, <laughs> you know, because we have this original copy or something like that, you know, an older one. And they go, how much of this is the same? And you're like, hey, we're doing pretty good, you know. But you also have to study the kind of ways people talked. You know, lots of Paul's letters are written. He's a pretty sophisticated guy. So he's writing letters to people in formats. Like, we would write formal letters now. Like, if you need to send a cease and desist order or something like that, and you hire a lawyer to write it, they write certain ways to make sure that these things are communicated in the legal world we have now. We're going to cover all our bases, and we're going to do it just so. That way, this letter has some value to it. 2,000 years later, you might look at it and go, why did, the, did people talk like this? This is pretty odd. And then like, They didn't, but legally they did. Paul's writing letters that are sort of like that from time to time. You know, they're not just like, dear friend, I've been thinking about, you know, this kind of thing. You see what I'm saying? And so Matthew, this book was written, um, I will say this, I'm going to share you some of this, this is like kind of people's best guess, because some of these letters that Paul wrote, they have examples to compare them against, meaning literal examples, like this follows this exact format, so it's this type of, but you have to kind of assume from the content of this book what its purpose was. They don't always, and sometimes Paul in his letters would include you know, hey guys, this is how this is to be used and things like that. But the book of Matthew is a story of Jesus written in just such a way. So what way was that? And it was written primarily to a Jewish audience. And it was written primarily to help new believers who are mostly Jewish get to the bottom of and have good understanding of Jesus is the chosen one, the Messiah we've been waiting on. And I'm going to lay that out. Here's this happened. And that happened to fulfill this, this uh, prophecy. And here this happened. And Jesus did this. That happened to fulfill this prophecy. And here this happened. And, that, and, and you can tell a lot of that his intended audience is primarily Jewish, new Jewish believers. Or maybe even Jewish people who are wondering about all of this. Because of how he does that. He makes references to um, scriptures that non-Jewish people wouldn't know. And also practices throughout the book that Jewish people did, that other people didn't. You know, Jewish people had feasts that the Bible lays out, and traditions, and festivals, and even sayings, you know, expressions like we have in our culture from, you know, thousands of years of, well, now thousands of years of Judaism that has been gra- we've been grafted in with the, as new believers to Christianity, you know, that uh, he, he sometimes takes the time to explain it. Sometimes he assumes you know. That's part of the way they know it's mostly for a Jewish audience. It's like you wouldn't get this if you weren't Jewish. You see what I'm saying? But it also includes within it a consistent message that there's a mission to the Gentile people with this message, which includes most of us or all of us if there's no Jewish people here. And we're grafted into the kingdom um, through what Jesus has done. And so I want to look through this, a story you all know, um, and I'm going to try to kind of pick at it in ways maybe you haven't thought about in the context of waiting on God as we wait on him to fulfill promises in the most epic level, his return, and in the most intimate personal level, 
what he's promised you about your children. You see these kinds of things. You do matter. These, whatever, these kinds of things. So what it feels like to be in the middle of that. The book of Matthew starts with a genealogy laying out, you know, Jesus' heritage. And it's interesting, he lays it out in the Jewish way. If you look in the book of Luke, he lays it out in the Roman way, where you start and you go back. In Matthew, he starts from the back and works forward. And he also truncates the list a little bit. He leaves out some names that aren't necessary, maybe, and he also maybe adapts and changes some names when they're not exactly sure why. People hypothesize, but the thing is, the way Jewish genealogies worked they had spiritual significance and they had meaning. They were supposed to even teach within the genealogy parts of who Jesus was. He was even in the genealogy making a case for who Jesus is as the King and the Messiah. And it starts with that and it moves immediately into the story of Mary and Joseph. And that's what we're going to focus on. So we look in Matthew 1.18, you read this. Um, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And then it continues this. This is the kind of thing I was talking about. Verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet Isaiah. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's Isaiah 7, 4. And you'll see this pattern throughout the book. He makes a claim about something Jesus did, and he ties it into the Old Testament. He makes another claim, he ties it in. And we all know this. If you've been around church for a couple of years, this happens every year. We celebrate Christmas, and we celebrate this story, and we know Mary and Joseph and the baby and everything. But I want you to just put yourself in this guy's situation. And knowing how you felt about promises God's put in your life and things you've been waiting on God to do. And so this guy finds himself uh, engaged to be married. Or I was reading about the betrothal process, and it works differently than we do now. And so they would, um, and the people, the readers of this would know this. That's why, you know, it needs explaining a little bit that you would say with, with your involvement and your parents' involvement, make an arrangement with another family. I am going to marry this person, which we might call engaged now. They would say betrothed, like that's starting the betrothal process. And there's some exchanges. And then there's a period of time where you're, like we would say, engaged, but you're doing more and more things together. You're getting the, all this acting. And then at one point, there's a consummation period, which, you know, let the hero understand, and there's a celebration, and then you're fully married, all right? So Joseph is just like us. He's, st- he's like we we're saying, Jesus has come and inaugurated this kingdom, and there's a kingdom coming that's pretty good. Let the hero understand. And <laughs> he's in the middle, right? And so kind of legally, in their culture, in their context, and as Jewish people, he's basic, they're married, okay? You wouldn't say engaged and not married like we would think. They're, they're married now because this has started. It's just not fully all the way through yet, okay? Then he finds out his wife is pregnant. That's unsettling, as it would be to all of us. And you have to pretend like you don't know the story yet. You actually kind of see, this is a pretty good guy. You know, I can see why God goes, that's the guy that should be <laughs> the father of my son, you know? Because he's... You know, according to the law, and Moses is like, he can legally divorce her. And what divorce means is she's probably not going to get married again, which means she probably will never have an income, which means she's, probably, she's basically outcast in some sort of way for the rest of her life. And he's, and he's right to do that, okay? And he doesn't even want to embarrass her. He loves her this much. But he's probably crushed. Like, you don't often 
encounter situations like this, you know, put this in this kind of context. God's promised this marriage. Like, it's coming together. It's all happening. It's like, hey, by the way, I'm pregnant. What? Don't worry. It's God who did it. Like, oh, sure. That sounds plausible. You know, and I think it's reasonable here that God sends an angel to tell him this. One, because it, it's a pretty big deal. You know, we're talking about Jesus, the Savior of the world. You know, letting people know a little bit what's going on, especially those intimately involved, is helpful. You know, and I like it when God goes extra links to tell me things. You know, and frankly, God sending angels as messengers is not something that stops in the Bible. It continues this day. Okay? And I think that we, like the Bible says we entertain angels and we don't know it. So odds are a lot of us in here have met angels and we just don't know that. And if you go, that sounds stupid. Okay. But, I mean, you, know, you have a problem probably with the Bible and not with me. You know, God's up to doing these things. You see, we have to get past God in a book. God I can control. God I can do whatever I want and make you say whatever I want. The trouble, Jesus is... Jesus is alive now. He does what he wants. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? We are his followers. We are children of the king. But he's the king. (laughs) And one of the things he's doing is sending angels to do things. And he sends one here. We have it on paper. If you believe his word, Joseph gets visited by an angel. And people are being visited by angels now. And uh, the... uh, Well, we could say a lot more about angels. Maybe for another day, all right? But... I think it's appropriate that uh, God sends an angel to him. But this is an interesting thing. Um, I don't know if that angel said to him the same thing that the writer of the book of Matthew includes right after this. This was done. This, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. That was on a piece of paper, and it was in the minds of the priests and the the scribes, and probably most of the Jewish people. Like, see, their biblical level of even... (laughs) We don't know the Bible probably like at all compared to most people. In the last, um, our, like I said, our faith is that our faith as Christians goes back 2,000 years, right? And of that 2,000 years, those of us that call ourselves Christians now probably know the Bible in our heart and mind and everything the least. And that's because we don't read it. And uh, when we do, uh, it's like small amounts and everything. These people, this is all they had. Um, and it was very important to them as Jews to like memorize large portions of Scripture. So I think that even though Joseph not a, a priest, um, if the angel says to him, this was done in this way, you know, he'd go, oh, yeah, that's in Isaiah. You know? um, and I'm not saying that just to convict everybody, but we should know the Bible better. But the, uh, what I'm saying is when God speaks to us, and promises us things that are subjective, meaning you feel like God has promised you something, um, it needs to be confirmed by his word. That's one of the biggest ways we can tell if this is actually God talking. <laughs> you, you know. And so this, uh, this quoting Isaiah is incredibly comforting to this man, if it happened, and if not, we have that now to, to look at. Um, but the other thing is this. Put yourself in this guy's shoes. So first, you've been in the, I'm promised this thing, this marriage, and I've started it, and it's good, and it's godly, and it's right. Now my wife tells me she's pregnant. Don't worry, God did it. And I go, okay, sure. And then God says, no, I really did do it. I sent an angel. I'm sending an angel to tell you. So you go, okay, now I'm convinced that God did do this. But what did God do? So like, he's looking, I'm going to get married to my wife and probably have a nice life. You know, I'm a contractor, I'm making money, we live a nice life, and whatever, you know, maybe I'll get a boat, you know, these kinds of things we think about. And God's like, no, I've decided to save all humanity through your firstborn child. And you're like, wait, I didn't quite sign up for that, you know. And then what do you, what do you tell uh, 
What do you tell people about that? You know, um, that's, that's quite a huge burden to put on somebody. And God decided it was time to do that. And God is right to do these sorts of things. So first off, he's in a situation where this, this, this announcement from his wife and then from the angel requires qu- quite a bit of faith to trust. Because it's more plausible that that didn't happen. Okay? Because often, virgins don't have children. And aren't pregnant. So, the <laughs> logic would be like, that's probably not what happened, you know, and, uh, and so he, it requires a great amount of faith to believe this. So now you believe it, and then God's like, oh yeah, and by the way, I did this, but it's because he's the Savior. You go, what? My kid? Me? Like, how are you using me in this way? These are normal people. Do you follow what I'm understanding? Do you follow what I'm saying? People don't walk around going, I bet I'm the savior of the world. And if they do do that, try not to talk to them or be involved in much of what they're doing, okay? Um, And so even finding out what God has in store through his promise tends to be when God gets involved in our lives so much more than what we're thinking. But don't think it will take less faith to believe. Okay? It's going to take more. But it's stepping stones. And he's making an announcement that Jesus is, that this son that you're going to have is the, is, is the king of the Jews, the one that we've been waiting on in your book, your prophet. The Jews have been waiting for this now. And it's your son. But even maybe deeper than that, as Pastor Jeff said, that in the creation, God creates man, and we choose to go against him and say, we've got this. We'll be our own God. And sin enters the world, and death enters the world. And God says, even though you did this, (laughs) I love you so much that I'm still going to fix it. And I'm starting a plan to fix it. And he started and he chose a man, Abram, who became Abraham. And through his descendants, don't worry. Well, like Jeff said last year, last week, one day a descendant will come and he will crush you, Satan. And that's who now is going to be your child. But not just the king of the Jews, okay? Jesus is the king of everyone. And in the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is a similar type book in that it's written primarily maybe as a teaching instrument, like the book of Matthew. They say maybe Matthew is is like, we need to write all this stuff down and have it in a way that people understand to be taught so they can know what Jesus did, how he did it, and all of the Jewishness of it. And what the importance of that is. In a similar way, the book of Hebrews is dealing with some of the same subjects. It's saying like the Old Testament, here is what we did. And this is how Jesus is in response to that. And then, you know, then it goes through like, you know, uh, Jesus, the, this is the law. And this is how Jesus is like. And, this is the, you know, and then it gets to this weird story in Hebrews 7. And he's talking about the priestly order that God had established about atonement. And it prefigured... He gave a picture in the Old Testament. You can read through it, Exodus, Leviticus, and all this. He starts to establish a temple, which had a purpose of God's dwelling on the earth, and how you dealt with sin and other things in relationship to God, because we have a sin problem, you follow? So he's like, here's how we're going to do this. And it's making a picture of what Jesus is going to be like. You find this in the book of Hebrews. He's saying, here's how this worked, and here's how it's going to work now, going forward with Jesus now as the high priest. But he says something strange. He says, so Jesus is a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And you go, who is that? But the readers would know who that is. Because you see a story in Genesis, and you can go read the rest of Hebrews 7. That's not the main point of what I'm talking about. But he makes it this, he's laying out the Aaronic priestly order from the tribe of Levi and all this. And then he's like, but Jesus is like them, but he's, he's not from Levi's tribe. He's from the Judah. And he's like, but 
he's a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. You're like, who is this Melchizedek guy? Well, in Genesis 14, um, there's a story. Abram is going to, uh, Abram is now promised, he's, he's the, the man through which God is going to start enacting this whole plan of salvation of the world. You know? And then he has these experiences and he's going in the, you know, this and that. And, the promise. and then his nephew gets locked. He, he gets, long story short, he rescues his nephew from some bad kings, right? And he ends up, you know, taking care of business with a bunch of them and all this kind of stuff. And then other people come out and go, hey, man, great job, you know. And one of them is this guy, Melchizedek, who is, they say, the priest of Salem. And as Hebrew says, doesn't have any parents, doesn't have any lineage. And he doesn't say he was born. It doesn't say he died. And he offers Abraham a blessing and prays. And he offers him wine and bread in a very sacramental way. And Abraham receives them and gives back to him a tithe, a tenth of everything he has from the you know, reaction. And the book of Hebrews makes a big deal out of that and how important it is for all of us to give to the Lord, but also what that meant about who this Melchizedek person was. And I was reading about it because people don't totally agree exactly who this man was. You know, was he an actual man or was he Jesus or some picture of Jesus that we don't fully understand? There's a term biblically where you talk about it's called a Christophany, which means an appearance of a bodily Jesus before he was born, you know, and there's several events in the Old Testament where Somebody shows up, and most and a lot of the times people think, "Oh, that must have been Jesus." It had to have been because the kind of things he said about himself and the kind of things he did. Angels don't do that. They say, "Don't worship me. I'm in, I'm created just like you, you know." And don't do these kinds of things, and don't give me these things, and don't act that way around me. And sometimes these encounters with these people don't do that, and we go, "Gosh, that must have been Jesus." And he did very Jesusy like things. And I don't know if this Melchizedek was Jesus, but I know that at least the writer of Hebrews saw fit to tell us that Jesus is in this order. And when you see Jesus on the last day before he dies, he offers his disciples this wine and this bread. And so we're going to pause now in this message and we're going to take this communion. And we're moving this in our service as we go to towards Christmas, have you noticed, Pastor Jeff did this before his message last week, now we're doing it in the middle, and next week Kevin's going to do it in the middle, and, we're, and it's how God's plans move and come through faithfully in time. But I will say this, the reason I'm speaking on this microphone and not that microphone is I woke up this morning with a cold and a fever, and uh, I took a lot of pills so I feel better now, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't feel good enough. I said to Jeff, I was like, hey, I might need you to do the communion thing. And he's like, I'm not feeling great either. And I was like, oh, awesome. And so he was like, well, we might be all right. And I was like, well, probably shouldn't be stupid. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I, God could take care of it. But what I felt like when the Lord was saying to me is this. Through what Jesus has done in our lives, we're all priests. The kingdom of priests is how this is described. That means every single one of us is a priest. And like Jesus, like Melchizedek, and like Jesus asks us to do, to do this in the remembrance of him. We need to see it this way. I know the church has sometimes, I, th- I think, probably gotten this wrong, sometimes for good, good reason and sometimes for bad. So I'm not arrogantly saying up here, look how wrong everyone was for so long. But I do believe this is an incredibly important event in the life of Christian people. But I think that its importance and significance is all because of God And we've elevated it in a weird way that we say, like, only a pastor in the North American sense can do this. That is wrong. You all can serve communion to anyone at any time on behalf of Jesus. And to represent that in a way, I've asked Tim McLean, Pastor Tim McLean, to come up here. And he is a pastor of of the orphanage in Kenya. And he's, so he's not, you know, but... He's going to come up here and actually do this, and I'm going to receive it just like everybody else, and then we'll finish off this message. So come on up here, and uh, um, he's going to hand this to you on behalf of Jesus, and I've asked a few other people to help serve, but 
I'll let him use another microphone so we don't test the Lord, right? I'll wipe this one off before the next church comes in. So. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, and I do take uh, communion very seriously, too. And I've even not taken it at times because I felt like it was just something that everybody does, you know. And I take it very seriously. And not to make it a traditional thing or something you just do every Sunday. So uh, and when Brian asked me if I'd do this this morning, I said, sure. Uh, so uh, at, following up with him, uh, we're going to go ahead and take communion. And uh, uh, do you have, you have two other couples? You, whoever is coming up to help me, Kathy, you can come up too. After uh, meeting with uh, the disciples uh, for the Last Supper, uh, Jesus, uh, the, the scriptures say he took uh, the bread and he broke it, and he blessed it, and he said to uh, his guys, he said, this is my body. He said, take it and eat. So we're going to go ahead and break this. I was going to say, hefty <laughs> loaf of bread <laughs> And then the Bible says he took the wine and he said, this is the blood of a new covenant with you and drink. And quickly, I just want to say a covenant, uh, whether you call it a contract or a will or a testimony or whatever, a covenant is usually between two people. Okay, There's an agreement between people that I'm going to do this and you do that. In this case, though, Jesus' part of the covenant had already been put into motion. The wheels had started. The, the gears had already started working. And so what he's saying to us is he's saying, my part's already done, folks. Now, if you take this, you're agreeing with me that you're going to do your part. He said, you do this in remembrance of me. And so I want to take just a second here. I'm going to give this a down. I want to take just a second. I want just a minute of quiet time of you to search yourself before you partake of this and to make sure that we are right with the Lord. Uh, and I don't know situations, but I know myself. I have to have a second, a few seconds of inner inspection before I partake. So I'm going to just give us just a couple of seconds of quiet time here, and then I'll pray and we'll bless this. And Father, we just thank you today, Lord. We thank you for this time of year and you coming to this earth and to be an example for us. And God, that... Uh, you know, that we could do this in remembrance of you and what you did on that cross for us many, many, many years ago. And God, we just ask that you, our hearts would be clean before you. And Lord, that uh, God, we would come and we would take the bread of your body, we would drink the wine of your blood, and God, that we would begin to be and act and do like you and in remembrance of you. And everything that we do, God, would be an example of your love that you gave for us. And God, we just thank you 
and we bless you, and we just praise you, Jesus. Amen. So I want you, you guys can come, and uh, Trudy and Donald will be over there. Kathy and I will be here, and um, Kevin and uh, Kayla will be over there. And just uh, come on up and uh, take the elements. Amen. I want to say this because I had a chance to think about uh, how this could have come off. I didn't ask Tim to do that as like a, we need the B team or something like that. Um, it was not my intention because I thought I'd do it myself, but I, you know, but I do believe that what the Lord has done is he's made a, a picture of what this is to be like. Because how awesome was that? And he had no time to prepare for that. <laughs> I said, hey, I need you to do this. And he was like, uh, what do you mean by do it? And I was like, do it. And he was like, okay. And that was that awesome. You see what I'm saying? And that capacity is within every single one of us. And it doesn't all have to look the same. I mean, how, how powerful was that? And that was different than, Pastor, than Tim. What Tim did is different than what Jeff has ever done. It's different than how I would have done it. And it's different than how you would have done it. But when we act on behalf of God, we're allowed and we should let God speak through us. And how we are, because he made us. Okay, guys? But thank you, Tim, for doing that. That was powerful. But I want to talk about Matthew 2 now, about the Gentiles, and everybody else was also waiting. We've talked about how the Jews were waiting for the, their king, their Messiah, their deliverer to come. And now, what about everybody else? 
because the rest of us are waiting on this because the savior the king of the jews is the king of the universe you see what i'm saying he can't be anything less and so it matters to all of us, any of us who will put our faith in Jesus. But it mattered even then. And this is the this story I always find to be it's one of my favorite Christmas stories because it's so odd. And you just put yourself back in this place, okay? And I'll try not to import too much of our cultural baggage, even though it's sometimes fun to do so. Matthew 2, starting at verse 3. or Well, I'll tell you a little bit of the story, and then I'll read. So... You know the story. We call it like we three kings, the three wise men. We don't know if there was three, but we know there were these guys who um, came to find out about Jesus because they saw in the stars that it was time. Now, that should come as a challenge to any uh, faithful Jewish person at the day because the law of God prohibits these types of things. Don't look to the stars, it says, you know. This is astrology. You follow what I'm saying? They're finding meaning in the orbits of the stars and deriving God's its spiritual purpose and meaning in the movement of the stars. So created things moving, they're seeing meaning in it in a way that God forbids in his people. Okay, it's very interesting if you read the Bible honestly to see how, you know, God enacts a plan to save uh, the world and he has a people and has a way for them to live. And everybody else is kind of figuring it out on their own, you know, and God is not unfair. I'm not trying to make it sound like that because we're pretty we can come up with some rotten stuff and we still do and we still have. But my point is spirituality doesn't go away. When you read about like, you know, E. Stanley Jones is missionary to uh, India he was like saying, he's like, these people here, <laughs> they're not not spiritual. <laughs> like, frankly, they're far more spiritual than we are in America. This was 100 years ago, you know. He's like, what they don't have is the right grid and the right, they don't have an understanding. We, I mean, need to plug them into, you know, what God is saying. But they're not not spiritual. They're not not earnest. And they're not not trying, you know. And so you find these guys that are kind of in a similar situation. Nobody knows who these people are. People have theories. I like some of them. I don't know about the other ones. But either way. Um, God's willingness to use them for this purpose, I think, has to be taken into account. And it can give us great hope. Because they show up and say, the stars told us the king of the Jews is being born. And you can see, starting in verse 3, when Herod, who was the king, heard this, he was disturbed. And so was all Jerusalem with him. There was kind of, at the time, even weirder. This was not uncommon. These pagan astrologer guys... When they showed up and made proclamations, and I guess they have enough of these recorded that we can make this claim well enough, they weren't wrong a lot. So when they came up and said, hey, we've noticed this change in the heavens, and you know th what this meant was you're probably going to die, king. That's what they hear. You're going to die because there's a new king coming. And they're like, oh, man, you know, or there's a war coming or these types of things. And they got enough of them right that people were freaked out, okay? In a similar story, you look in the Old Testament when Saul has been, you know, he's... He's gone awry, and he's, you know, he's trying to, you know, the prophet is dead. and he, So he goes to a witch. It says the witch of Endor, like in Return of the Jedi, and asks her to conjure up the spirit of prophet so he can ask him some questions. And it works. And he says, why did you do this? And he's like, oh, you know, it doesn't work out in the sense of like, it doesn't work how he wanted it to work. But my point is, the witch lady conjures up a dead guy, and the dead guy comes and talks to the living guy. That should be a challenge to our understanding of spirituality, okay? In the same way, this is a challenge. These guys show up. Verse 3, when the King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, because these guys get enough of this stuff right that it's bothersome. And all of Jerusalem with him, when he had called together the people, so he, so he, he responded. He called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law and asked them, where is the Messiah going to be born? And they say, correctly, in Bethlehem in Judea. For this is what the prophet has written. And they quote, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, 
are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And it goes on. That's from the prophet Micah 5.2. It's in your Bible. And they knew this. And they knew it probably like that. Where is he going to be? Here. Okay. And so this is, again, delete all of your knowledge of what happens next. The, the king Herod, you know, goes, okay, thanks. And he tells these guys Bethlehem, which means he has to, like, he believes these guys. You see what I'm saying? He doesn't go, yeah, right. And he doesn't go, you know, he, he acts like, okay, they told me where he's going to come. He has, hear me in the right way, he has pretty good faith here. You know, he'll be in Bethlehem. All right, he's in Bethlehem. And they go, thanks. And they go on, but he's like, bye, bye. before you go, though, if you find him, let me know, because I would like to go worship him. And it lets you know that really he wants to kill him because he's worried that he's, but again, hear this the right way. His desire to kill this baby is a certain depiction of his faith. He's threatened by this. And I'm not saying faith in God. I'm just saying belief. Yeah. He's, 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 he, he thinks this stuff's real. Real enough that I need to do something about it. And then, frankly, he does. But the weirdest part to me is, why didn't anybody else go? Like, I think sometimes if I was one of those other priests and teacher guys, I might be like, can I go with them? And I'll let you know if he, you know, I mean, if it's, you know... <laughs> Well, we don't, you know, that doesn't happen. And these guys go as representatives of the rest of us, okay? The rest of us who are looking for our Savior as well and our King. And what do they do? They find him and they bring before him expensive gifts. And they, they properly honor the King. Glory be to the newborn King. These are the songs we sing. And they lay before him very expensive and prophetic Meaningful gifts that honor not only him as a king, but all of what he's here to do as a prophet, a priest, a king, and the savior of the world. And then God again helps out with an angel and says, hey, don't go back and tell that guy because he really has a bad guy. Go some other way. And I was reading about the other way that they had to go because they have pretty good understanding where these roads went. And Bethlehem is not exactly far from Jerusalem. Like now if you go to Jerusalem, which is a big city, it's like, where's Bethlehem? It's like, there. Like, that's still in Jerusalem, isn't it? You know, it's kind of like, it's not even Orange Park level. It's like, you know, but the old city was smaller, and they have that. And then over there is Bethlehem. It's not that far away. And uh, so to go an alternate route, because Jerusalem was a pretty, you know, significant city, they had to go pretty wide, like, it took a long time. And they're, like, riding, I don't know, camels or something and walking, you know. Why am I saying that? They, they, uh, God's willingness to accept these gifts, I think, is a testament to his willingness to use everyone. Because he doesn't go, no guys. And this is, and keep in mind, this is in the book of Matthew. And remember I said at the beginning, he's going to great lengths. I wrote this down from a commentary. Jesus is the epitome of all of Israel's hopes. And it also represents missions to the Gentiles. Outreach to the Gentiles is rooted in both the Old Testament and New Testament teachings of Jesus. And you see immediately in this story, chapter 1, this is our Messiah. Chapter 2, he's the king of everyone and the savior of the world. And he accepts the gifts of from the least of these. These guys were smart. They were wealthy. But spiritually, they were the least. They were not descendants of Abraham. Okay? They're coming from everywhere else. The rest of us. Kayla, come on up here. and We're going to get... I like having music behind while I finish. The point is this. Never put limits on who God can use and what God can do through them. Because in this story... I did say Herod did have faith. He believed enough of this to be scared by it. And the scribes and Pharisees believed it enough that they'd carried this promise for a long time. 
And they knew the answer like this. But the only people in the whole story that just know, okay? Mary and Joseph get told by an angel, like God action. These guys get told by the testament that God had laid down over a thousand years. The, in the traditional manger scene, the shepherds get told because they're out there and they see angels praising God. The only people that figured it out are these guys. Based on something that's probably not good. Or at least God has not sanctioned it in the sense of, you know, this is what I want you to be doing since he prohibits this type of thing. That challenges me. Because when I walk with Jesus in this kingdom, they were like Joseph in, in the middle of the inauguration. Like it hasn't fully come. It's not fully realized. What it will be like when Jesus returns is heaven on earth, you see? We're not quite there. But as the church, we are the kingdom now. We're ambassadors in an unholy land or in darkness. We are the light bearers. We talked about carrying this little light. We are light bearers. And stuck in the middle like this, watching God unfold the rest. Because when he comes again, it's going to be kind of like this again. It's not theoretical. It's not just spiritual. It's in every way reality can be real. It's that real and more so. And it does challenge me, and it will challenge you. And the things that God does are incredible, but always, or very often, surprising. Like, gosh, that guy? That person? Why? You know, and God's, and I, I don't know. I'm not going to stand up here and act like I always know. I've been so challenged by God's willingness and openness and acceptance and love. It keeps me coming back. Because if it was something I could just figure out, I got this end thing figured out. I know exactly how it's going to work out. I don't need you guys. And you don't need me. I'm good. There it is. But his kingdom is breaking in now. And there's going to be a moment where it fully breaks in and it's going to come, you know, in ways at times that you're not expecting. It'll blow our minds. I guarantee you it's better than what we have envisioned. It says no mind, no eye can see, no ear is heard. We haven't got it all figured out. And I'm going to end with this. The hope that we have should not be limited by our, by our understanding. Okay, I'm not saying don't use your mind. You have to. And use it as, as much as you got, use it. But don't let it limit things. It's not in charge. Jesus is king, not your brain. I, I'm, I'm relatively smart. This is a problem for me. Because if I can't understand something, I get angry. You can ask my wife. <laughs> and I get mad at God because I couldn't understand what he's doing. It's not right to be that way. But the hope that God has given us to give to everyone their belovedness that they don't know. We have that gift this Christmas to give and for the rest of our lives. There's work to be done. What do you do while you're waiting? That was what I was going to end with. What do you do? The point is, heaven on earth is coming. It's not here yet. But we are the bearers of it now. And we can bring it and we can live in it. It won't be any more real than it is now. What could be real or more real is how much we believe it. It doesn't mean it won't be hard. Jesus himself, the perfect one, ended his earthly life dying on a cross. And he says no servant is greater than their master. The cost in the ways that we would count them in our world are severe. Or at least severe costs are not out of bounds. And no one will enter the narrow gate without dying to themselves. Next week, Kevin's preaching about the same idea. We're still waiting on our king. And he's talking out of the book of Luke. 
I'm going to read from chapter 4 what Jesus says about himself and therefore what he says about us in a way as his ambassadors now. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me or upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free. And Jesus was quoting Isaiah. So I pray, we end our services often. I was, we've talked about this a lot. We end with altar calls, um, which in a sense carries tradition a lot of way. But the way we usually do it is kind of a, a, a leftover or carry over from even the second great awakening where it's like repent come forward you know and uh but we don't always off I mean, whatever i'm asking you not to do that today that's all i'm trying to say i want you to sing a song with us and we sing a song like christmas joy to the world this song is about freedom and joy it's not joy to the world we'll sing that another time but um i asked kayla to sing a song, and this is the one that the Lord brought to us as a band beforehand, is where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I want to pray that as we um, as we sing it, that God's joy would fill our hearts, fill this place, and that we would uh, fully embrace the kingdom now that He's given us. So I want you to stand, and I'm going to get my guitar. came to set the captives free, guys. 